So. <laughs> hey, um, that was great. Good. And I uh, appreciate him saying, go ahead. Would you pray over, I just started coughing. Would you pray over the sick people? I mean, I know several people who yeah. told me they were sick and that's why they're not here. Sam McVeigh being one yeah. of them. I was going to say one thing real quick, and that is that I appreciate his word, the idea of order in the community. And on some level, that's what I want to talk about, is order in our relationships. Uh, in, in the degree, I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. But Father, we thank you for uh, these moments. Thank you for uh, uh, what you are doing in all of our lives. And thank you that uh, we have and know Jesus uh, and the Spirit of Christ who lives with inside of us to uh, to bring us together and to teach us what it means to love one another. Father, may the words that I share be a blessing to that end, that you teach us more and more what it means to love one another. Father, we do ask you to pray for Sam and for David and for any and all of us who've got a crud or a bug we're dealing with. Uh, my wife actually just came down with last night to pray for a blessing upon her. Pray, pray to bring healing and strength to each of us. And, uh, and, and actually, even times when we're down, may you speak to us even in those moments. But uh, rise us up again, we pray, to uh, continue to live for the King of Kings. And uh, love you with all of our heart and soul and mind strength and to love our neighbors ourselves. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we will share with you some thoughts today. I've actually written most of it out because I've been thinking a lot about what I want to say, and I, I want to make sure I say it all. Um, so here we go. Um, uh, most of you know me either as a pastor. For 14 years, I was an associate pastor at the church here in town. Or as a marriage counselor. Um, I've done that for almost 35 years now. For the past year and a half, though, I've been rebranding myself as a conflict coach and peacemaker. And when I look back over my life, I kind of realize that that's really more of who I've been all of my life. Um, it, it, it's funny when you take some time, as David always says, you know, share a little bit about your history. When you take some time to look back at your life, I'm 58 now, and it's funny kind of what stands out. And so these are these things that have always stood out to me, which kind of helped me understand a little bit more about who I am and how God has used all those things in my life. So it's funny. I'm convinced that what we remember is significant and it has shaped who I am today. I grew up in a home where, where my parents, uh, my grandparents on both sides, all of my aunts and uncles, my cousins, my second cousins, my great aunts and uncles, they were all new Jesus. And it wasn't just kind of a little bit of knowing Jesus. We loved Jesus uh, and had missionaries in the family and seminary teachers and leaders. It, it was just an amazing experience uh, to grow up uh, in, 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 that, uh, in that community. That was my primary experience in life with my family. I knew I was loved by my family and by God and we all loved each other. I also grew up in a wonderful independent Bible church where I can, I don't know when I said the first time, uh, Jesus, you know, I love you, be my savior, or prayed the prayer or whatever, and I prayed the prayer many times growing up, you know, I kind of do it just to make sure, kind of do it. <laughs> but, but somewhere down there, and when I, I've, I've been a part of a Bible-believing church since I was five years old, or actually probably since I was born, and I'm, again, very grateful for that part of, uh, part of my heritage. Um, because of all that, I know how good relationships can be. Because of the greater family that I grew up in and the greater community of, of the body of Christ, I know how good relationships can be. But contrast that with having friends in, in, in public school and in my neighborhood whose families were broken and really a mess. My three best friends in the neighborhood had all had split families and, 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 and uh, multiple sets of parents. And, and, I, and I noticed that. I remember thinking back about those, the, the contrast. And so that stood out to me as I again sat back and thought of my history. And it was sad to me. I remember even as a child thinking, this is just sad. And in my own family, though again I, I, I say that I, I always grew up knowing I was loved, feeling loved, and, 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 and the love of Jesus, I, my own family was still not without its squabbles. 
my brother and I wrestle each other a, a lot and always try to get the other person in trouble. <laughs> um, <clears throat> things said and done um, in my family or someone was hurt or angry. But what stands out to me <clears throat> as I look back at all that again is that I was always significantly aware of the pain in relationships. Pain caused by words. There's a scripture that I often think about, the proverb that says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so literally the words that come out of my mouth speak life or they speak death. And I, that has always stood out in my mind growing up. And I wished somehow, they, even as a family, we could do better to speak more life words than death words. I also just grew up outside of Chicago where the, when there was a lot of racial tension. And I had friends who were white, friends who were brown, friends who were black. Good friends on all sides. But I also remember having a number of experiences when I, when I was bullied. And I didn't know what to do. I remember those mo many of those moments just being afraid and not knowing what to do. Those were memories uh, that I, I had but that stand out to me along with those accompanying fears and those moments of just being so alone. And again, not knowing what to do in those moments. It's all very vivid for me, even as I still think about it. I have a strong memory of, of coming up stairs from this independent Bible church that I grew up on, in, and um, coming upstairs in, in the, I was probably about eight, eighth grade, and hearing the talk of a, 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 one of the strong Christian couples in our congregation just splitting apart. And just thinking, what? I was just stunned. What's going on and why? I remember in youth group for several years, people saying repeatedly uh, or, or repeatedly making fun or ridiculing somebody that I really, really cared for. And I remember trying to stand up for this person a lot as best as I could, but I didn't know how. I didn't, I didn't know that I did all that well. I wished it were different. I remember being sad again and hurt and angry about that a lot. So when I look back at all those things in my memory, it's not a real surprise to me that I ended up majoring in psychology in college and getting my master's in biblical counseling at Grace College in seminary in northern Indiana. God was directing that, although I believe that, moving me into that area and, and, and used all those experiences that just kind of stand out in different ways to cause me to want to work with people to somehow help bring peace in relationships. Shortly after I graduated from seminary, through a series of God incidences, we were asked to come to McPherson, Kansas in 1985 to start a Christian Counseling Center. And about three years later, we moved it to uh, Wichita. And if y'all remember the Better Book Room, uh, if you've been around that long, some of you have been around that long, we had a counseling center. It was called the Center for Biblical Counseling. We were on the third floor of the Better Book Room for a number of years. So I was there, and then the pastor of the church I was going to ask if we would come on staff and kind of be the local resident counselor at that, at that uh, church and then also uh, be an associate pastor. So I did that for about 14 years and it was a wonderful experience in many, many res respects. Uh, my, my, the whole side of my life that's interested in evangelism to, uh, grew because of being a part of that church and that pastor. Uh, growing up in the church that I did, I was always interested in discipleship in that area, but never really had a heart for the lost. But being up there for 14 years, God just broke my heart for people who don't know Jesus and the idea of, of reconciling them and bringing peace to them, to Jesus as well. So I'm very thankful for that church. At the same time, there were a number of difficulties in the church. And throughout the 14 years that I was there, there was a number of times when a large group of people just left. And I just remember thinking, ah! It's not supposed to happen. I remember thinking, I hate this. I hate that we can't get along as the body of Christ. Why is it like this? Those are, again, profound experiences that, that I think God, again, has used to continue to shape who I am and the directions that I've um, taken uh, in life. <clears throat> In 1995, I resigned from my position at the church, and I went back into private practice, uh, marriage and family counseling, which I've been doing now for the last 13 years. 
Um, and I've focused almost entirely in the area of communication and conflict resolving, and almost most entirely with, with marriages as well. But branching out into churches and businesses and doing a teaching and training uh, in the area of uh, peacemaking and specifically training people a process of how to uh, walk through conflict, how to talk, talk it through. Um, uh, we, we call it pledge talk, and the word pledge is an acronym for six steps that I teach and train people to use, how to, uh, when you have a conflict, how to actually <coughs> sit across the table and actually step by step talk it through and talk it out. And so uh, that's largely my focus now. And if God, unless God does something differently, that's probably going to be how I'm going to finish out my work um, and has continued to teach and train people that. I have a book over there that I've written two years ago that uh, speaks much about uh, or quote, that process and so forth. So over the past 35 years as an adult, <clears throat> one of the big things that stands out in my mind is how broken we are, even as Christians. How broken we are and how broken our relationships can be even as Christians. Christian marriages are breaking up at the same rate as non-Christian. That's been a statistic for years. Church staff teams are not doing well. I know that because I've been a part of church staff and, I've, and I know of other church staff situations being a part of the Wichita ministry network for 30 years. Staff don't know how to get along. Church families breaking up. Large groups of people moving, leaving, quitting. Pastors leaving the ministry because of conflict with their staff. I read a statistic just this week that at least one of four pastors are leaving because of conflict. And 80% of pastors are afraid of conflict in their congregation and not knowing what, what the impact it will have on their church. You might remember a story I shared last month or two months ago. <clears throat> David said he went to China with Steve. October. Three, three October, I went in June, July, something July. like that. July with Steve as well. <clears throat> Great guy that Steve Miller is. <laughs> no, seriously, Steve, I love you, man. You've been a huge impact in my life. I love that guy. Um, and uh, so we, we went, and, um, and I remember, uh, we, I actually had a chance to go with him two years ago, too, so it was a huge blessing. But on the, on the flight over to China this time, this, back in July, I, I said, Steve, i got to be honest with you, I don't know why I'm going back again. It just seems to me, if you're going to go to China or someplace, you're supposed to go and tell people about Jesus. Okay, you're going to go to the mission field, you got to, you got to tell people about Jesus. And so I feel like i got to go and be an evangelist somehow, and, and so that's why I, I need to be going. So I don't know why I'm going over here to talk about how to resolve conflict. Steve, I, I just don't quite get it. And he looked at me and he said, Mark, he said a month ago I had a conversation with one of his main contacts throughout all of China, who is really familiar with all what's happening all throughout China. And he says, Mark, pastors and ministry leaders all through our China are leaving the ministry because they have conflict with the people they're working with and they don't know how to resolve it. And I was like, oh, okay. That's why we're going. Okay. That was the plane ride over and that was a God moment to help set me and prepare me for what we'd be doing while we were over there. The last stop we made was with a ministry, beautiful ministry. Two gals are leading it, wonderful people. Mm. We find out the last day they were, we were there that they had a conflict and they were about to quit. And see, the incredible ministry fall apart right there. And I looked at them and I said, you can't quit. You can't do this. If God calls one of you away, that's good because everybody can celebrate with you. But you can't quit because of conflict. Because if you quit because of conflict, everybody else around you 
<clears throat> is going to have the same notion, the same idea that there will come a time in life when we just can't resolve our differences and all we can do is just quit and go our own way. That's going to carry down and trickle down to every relationship that they have, including their marriages. I looked at them and I said, you can't do that. We must learn and figure out how to deal with this. And praise God, they did. As we sat and talked and as they learned the process that I teach and so forth. And as I've heard back from them, that they're continuing to do well. And the ministry is continuing to grow. Thank you, Jesus. So happy and thankful and understanding again then why he, he would want us to go there. My heart and passion, and my wife and I, our heart and passion is to see marriages and families restored, it's to see people in churches and their leaders restored, it's to see the staff on churches restored and loving each other well, it's to see churches across a city working together and loving each other well. I believe loving well in the way we communicate with each other, loving well in the way we communicate with each other, and loving well in the way we work through conflict, and loving well in the way we bring about restoration in the church, in the family, in the workplace, is largely something we don't do very well. Even as believers, we don't do that very well. We talk about loving one another, and we set out to love one another, and we give to the poor, and we um, take up a special offering for somebody in need, and we say, someone's sick, let's bring food over to them, and we do all these neat things, and they are wonderful things. Yay, yes. But when it comes right down to it, I don't believe we know how to love each other well. Even when we sit across the table at each other like this. Like, for instance, how many of you, when you came in today, had the mindset, I'm going to sit by somebody who might be sitting by themselves? Was it even in your mind to love well like that? Or when we're sitting across from someone and engaging in conversation, has it crossed your mind to say or ask a question to really get to know the other person rather than just on a casual, how are you doing? Fine, I'm doing fine too, that's good. And just eating your food. How much do we really even think about loving well in the way we communicate when we're with people? You want us to say ouch now? How yeah. <laughs> <laughs> amen if that's convicting. <laughs> Why don't we know how to, in particular when we're experiencing conflict or, or experiencing differences, why, why don't we do well? And I think there's two reasons. One is we're, we're afraid of conflict. Every one of us are. And if you don't think you have conflict, you're not honest with yourself. Because we all have, are at odds with each other at different times to different degrees. That's a form of conflict. We all experience that, but we're afraid. I'm afraid, even with all I know and I teach and train, and I know how to do this. I really do. When my wife and I are in conflict, there's a part of me that's not afraid, because I, I know and she knows we're going to work this through, and it's going to turn out well, because we know how to do it. But I'm still kind of tense. It's not like I go, yay, today we have another conflict. <laughs> so this conflict is scary. But the second thing is, we don't know what to do when it happens. We've not been trained. There actually is a series of steps that are right steps and good steps and steps that you know are good when it happens with you or if someone loves you in that way, you go, this feels so great. I teach those steps with Pledge Talk. But we're afraid and we don't know what to do because we've never been trained. We've all had bad experiences in conflict to one degree or another. So we're afraid. And as a result, when 
Marine conflict, we either tend to over address an issue or avoid it altogether. And we all tend to fall in one of those categories. Two incidents come to my mind of uh, hotel incidences when I was with uh, an individual and um, we walked up to the hotel counter and the room that we were promised to get, they said, well, sorry, we don't have that room for you. We, we have another one. And in both of these situations, the, the person I was with turned back and said something like this, I'll take care of this, just watch me. <laughs> and they basically bullied their way to make sure we got the room that we requested. Re -re -requested. And these are Christian brothers. And I'm like, ah! It wasn't me. I <laughs> just I prayed somebody was going to it. Wasn't, it wasn't anybody in this room. Mark. It wasn't anybody like in this room. Up, man. You could have seen them going, David. David. No, but, but they over... Oh, my goodness, I can't believe this. They overdressed the issue. Okay? Um, they, were, they were like a lion. Okay? I, okay, I, I'm just going to say this. Some, somebody might say, well, that's who I am. I'm just kind of a lion. You know, the four, I'm a lion or a golden retriever or a beaver or an otter, right? Four personality types that you've heard someone, someone use and so forth. And I'm just a lion. That's just the way I am. Well, I tend to be a golden retriever, and I can say, well, I'm a golden retriever, so, you know, I don't really want to confront situations either. You know? or, 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 the, or the beaver says, I'm just too busy, you know, or the otter. Oh, you know, I'm... Let's just have some fun. We're off to deal with the issues, <laughs> right? All four personality types have a very self-protective component to them. And the tendency on our part is to use our personality type as an excuse for relational sin. We use our personality type as an excuse for relational sin. I'm a lion, so just to, to a spouse, I'm a lion. You just need to take care, take care of issues. That's just the way I am. And that man who's a lion to his wife excuses the way he is because of his, his personality, and he misses the fact that he's horribly speaking horribly unlovingly to his spouse. Or the one who's a golden retriever. Me, I can excuse um, you know, dealing with conflict as well because I'm just a golden retriever and I just like people, love people, I want them to love me and that kind of thing. And, but I'm using the same thing. I'm, I'm still using my personality as an excuse to avoid having to deal with conflict. It's a self-protective component to our personalities. The beaver, I'm just too busy. The otter, again, just come on, let's just have fun. It's a self-protective. For the most part, as, as believers, preachers, and teachers, when it comes to conflict, our answer is Matthew 18. <coughs> if you've got a conflict, go speak to the person. That's what the Bible says, right? Here's the problem. How many have ever tried Matthew 18 and it didn't work? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You've gone to speak to someone and they didn't respond very well. Mm -hmm. They were reactive, defensive, angry. You didn't know what to do after that. <laughs> well, you told yourself, well, the next step I need to do is get two people. So we just go get two people. And we get two people. We really come at them. And that point. And that didn't really go very well either, likely. Or how many, how many of you have been Matthew, <coughs> Matthew 18? In other words, somebody has come to you and spoken to you about something, a concern or a frustration. And then my question is, how did you handle it? Oftentimes, we don't know how to handle that when someone confronts us. And then we say, someone just the other day told me that they heard from so-and-so that they were really mad at me or really hurt by something I said. And I'm always thinking, why didn't that person come to me? I don't know. 
now is thinking, well, I don't know. Why didn't they come to you? And it could be either because they're afraid. They don't know how to handle conflict. It could be because they've gone to people in the past and they've tried to speak their concerns and it wasn't heard very well. The person didn't respond well. It could be that that person has tried to come to you and speak about a concern. And you didn't handle it well. And so they don't want to come again. And so they go elsewhere or talk to someone else. Does this mean Matthew 18 isn't true? No. It just means that, that, there's, that there's more we got to do, more thinking we have to do about that concept, more work that we have to do when it comes to the whole issue of speaking into each other's lives. We haven't thought enough about how to approach someone. We haven't taught enough about how to receive from others a concern or a frustration. We haven't created a culture in our marriage or in our families or in our churches or in our small groups or in our businesses where we can have this kind of openness and honesty. We've not created that kind of a culture. <clears throat> my daughter was having some difficulties in her life and uh, I thought I got the answers so I wrote her an email and uh, I had all this fine wisdom and I couldn't wait to hear from her. I figured, you know, half hour later, she'd call me and say, Dad, thanks for all the wonderful advice. It was amazing. <laughs> well, it didn't happen. A day went by, two days, three days. A whole week went by. Finally, my daughter calls me up. And I say, hi, sweetie. And she says, uh, hi, Dad. And she says, uh, can I talk a minute? I say, well, sure, hon, what's up? And she says, um, um, you know that email you sent to me a, a week ago? And I said, sure, hon, yeah, yeah, what, what, are you, what are you thinking? And she said, Dad, I actually was kind of really hurt by that. I said, you were? I was kind of hurt because I felt like you, you weren't treating me as a 26-year-old adult anymore, but kind of as your, as your little girl. And so I was kind of hurt. And in my head, I'm going, what? That's not true. I'm not teaching like a little girl. I'm your dad. I got some things to say. I'm just, I, got a, I'm, I got some wisdom. And I'm, not I, you're, and I'm just going and going and going and going and going. My head's just spinning, right? With all kinds of reactions. But at some point, I paused long enough in my head to say, or to remind myself of what I teach, because if I knew if I reacted or did or said anything at all like, honey, that's not true. <laughs> honey, why do you think that way? Honey, that's, that's not true. I'm, I'm just trying to be loving. I'm just trying. You said you were having some difficulties, and, and I, I assumed you were to want some advice. If I had done any of that, it would have shut her down. I knew there was one thing I could have done. And actually, this is true. This is one of the steps I teach. If someone's coming to confront me about an issue, there's, there's, there's two things that I can do. I can pause and I can listen. That's the first two, times, two steps. So I stopped my, my head from spinning around and I said, honey, tell me more. What do you mean? I was stepping into the listening mode because I wanted to hear the heart of my daughter. I promise you, had I done anything different, it would have shut her down and she might never have come to me again about a concern as my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I love my daughter. I love all my kids. I got the best kids in the world. 
Today is just beautiful. I love her to death. She's actually taking my material and writing it into a curriculum. She's a kindergarten teacher, and she's teaching her kindergarten kids how to work through conflict. It's incredible. Boy, this time always goes great. <laughs> so, when David asked me to speak, I, I thought oh, I could come up with all kinds of ideas of what to say and so forth. And really, what I wanted to do is, I really want to, I really want to, hopefully by God's grace, bring us to a place of saying, oh, maybe we don't do this really well, and we got to take some time to think about it. Maybe, maybe I need to think more about my relationship with my spouse or my kids or my staff or my church or my business partner and look at how I tend to handle those moments when things aren't going really well. I need to stop and do some more work on me. I'm hoping my talk could help you think in those ways and hoping that maybe as, a, as the church as a whole, we might get the idea that we need to stop and, and, and go deeper. I praise God we're doing the prayer thing. Some of us have been praying for Wichita in various ways for 30-some years, 20 years, 25. And it is awesome, praise God. I think this is the largest move of prayer that's happening now. And I'm grateful and I praise God. But I also want to say we, it also needs to go deeper into relationships, into truly how we love one another or don't, and how we get along different ministries, different churches, people in a church, staff, how we get along, and us, how we get along with our spouse or with a child or our neighbor. If I left you with two words, that the first two words again of the process that I teach, it's to pause and listen. And I would say this. When you find yourself in a conflict at any level with anyone this week or this month, this year, just pause a moment. Let your emotions dial down. And pray. Oh, God, help me to deal with this moment better than I have in the past. Or show me what I need to do in me so that I'm not reactive or defensive. Teach me how to love the person in front of me in a way that maybe I've never done before. Teach me how then to listen, to listen, to really understand because when my daughter's upset, something's going on. I can just react and say that's not true, or you're too you're being too sensitive. That's really helpful. Telling somebody you're just like your spouse or your daughter. You're just being too sensitive. Oh, that's really helpful. <clears throat> Instead, I need to hear her story. When somebody's at odds with you, there's a reason. And we need to take time to listen, to really understand the heart of what's going on. That's the beginning of learning how to resolve conflict well. And if you have conflict with someone and you're going to approach someone, I say the same thing. Pause and listen. Pause a moment. Don't just spew whatever comes to mind in the name of honesty. Pause a moment and say, as believers we can do this, we can say, oh God, how best can I speak to this person? And Father, is this the best time? Is this the best way? Pause and stop and think and pray about it. Listen to God, to the Spirit leading you to do that. David asked me this week when he was asking me to do this, he said, Mark, and by the way, I got something that I'm I'm having this with a person, and I don't know what to do. Should I do this or should I do that? I said, David, I said, David, 
you've taught me perhaps more than anybody else other than Steve Miller, both of you, that you need to stop and pray and listen. I said, David, with that particular situation you're asking me about, should you do this or that? I said, have you prayed and listened? And he said, oh, <laughs> you got me. And he said, I haven't. Pause and listen. Love to share a lot more. <clears throat> my challenge is, my hope is, that we go deeper in our relationships. That we really learn what it, how to restore. That we learn how to love each other well in the way we communicate and particularly when we experience conflict. That's my heart, that's my passion. If you want to learn more, there's a couple more ways you can learn. You can buy my book over there, it's 13 bucks. You can go to my website, my website is pledgetalk.com. You can get my card over there, it has that in there. On the back of the card it has the six steps. Or you sign up for my email, I blog on this weekly, and you get a full uh, an infographic that explains everything that I teach, a free download on that. Yeah, I'm saying, buy my book, do this. And I am, because I believe in it. Yeah. And I want to encourage you to get something over there. Um, and, 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 and let's make this a year of, of restoration where we will think through and learn how to deal with those tough moments with each other in a better way and a loving way. Amen. Amen. So, good job. You have to sit in those prayer